How are we doing this morning, guys? Good morning, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, everybody, uh, new faces, great to see new faces, familiar faces, everybody joining us online. Uh, we're glad you're here. Man, you guys look good, I gotta say. First things first, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving the festive Christmas sweaters. Did you like my Christmas sweater? Yes. Did you, did you notice the elf? See, I, have you seen the movie Elf, everybody? Yeah. Everybody, of course. It's a Christmas classic in our home, so I fell in love immediately as soon as I saw the elf and, you know, what was he saying? I love smiling or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. Lights and all kinds. I'm going to get some mileage out of that, that's for sure. <laughs> But I'm going to be teaching on something pretty, uh, pretty powerful today. So I didn't know if Will Ferrell staring at you with blinking lights <laughs> while I'm trying to deliver the powerful message that God has for us today. I didn't know how well that would sync up. So wardrobe change, but uh, wardrobe change, you bet. And why not? So uh, I'm, we're going to be, we're going to be. Uh, following a narrative today. I'm going to be doing a lot of storytelling today, as a matter of fact. So if you're a note taker, it'd be great to get your, your notebooks out. Um, but the first thing, one thing that we're going to keep coming back to is the simple phrase. Can I see this one simple phrase to start off with today, Asher? When God has a plan, nothing is going to stop it. We're going to keep coming. The more we study today, and we are going to be doing some studying today, okay? I warned you last week, right? Last week I said, we're going to do some great life application last week because the next two weeks we're going to really dig into the Word of God. We're going to really dig into the origin of the Christmas story. I think I shared online on the Facebook, I said, you know, this story that we love, we celebrate it every year. It's full of wonder and awe. But there is a lot more to this story, as a matter of fact, that you guys are going to discover over the next two weeks that we don't, we don't see on Christmas cards. We don't see in, in the Hallmark Channel movies. And it's powerful. And what it, what it shows and displays to us through every different phase of this story is that, simply put, when God has a plan, say it with me, nothing is going to stop it. Is that good news? Or is that good news, huh? So our, our sermon title for this week and next week is this. Can I see that, uh, that graphic? You'll see this online. Stephanie was just, was just talking about uh, uh, Facebook and all of the, all of the different uh, uh, ways that we can share. And that's good because we're a grassroots church, no outside funding. So, so free advertising is great. You'll see this online, and I encourage you guys to share it. I encourage you to share this message as well. Of course, we always invite our friends to church and get the word out about what God is doing in Bellevue that way. But this is also a great way. I, I, think, that, I think that you guys are going to um, really enjoy the next two weeks. So with that being said, I want to paint a picture for you this morning. I want to paint you a picture for you this morning. 63... BCE, the year was. In 63 BCE, the Romans began their occupation of Jerusalem. Israel, God's promised land, the Jewish people living in their homeland, a, a Roman occupation began. So I, I want you to think of this. When we think of the life of Jesus, we think that he was born in a manger. That's what we celebrate this time of year, right? It was probably fall, but we do it now. That's okay. Uh, we, we celebrate Jesus in a manger. That probably happened around uh, 2 B.C. And we'll talk more about that next week. 2, 3 B.C., there's some conjecture there. When Jesus was crucified, died for us on the cross and rose again and the tomb was empty, that would have been around 30 to 33 A.D. 32 is what I think, but there's conjecture there as well. So I want, I want you to uh, get this. I want to tell you all that because I want you to... Get the full picture. It was 63 years, 61-ish, before Jesus was even born, that the Romans began their occupation of Jerusalem. Now, they're being, I want you to get this. Imagine this for a moment. We're proud to be American, right? Amen? We're godless, and thank God, right? This will never be a socialist country, right? Amen. All right. You're in the right church. Okay. So, uh... <laughs> I want you to imagine communist China rolling down the roads in their tanks. Okay? I want, you to, I want you to think about what that would be like for our way of life 
as Americans to be occupied by another nation, okay? Uh, the TV and media likes to tell you that uh, um, the Jews are occupying Palestine right now. That couldn't be farther from the truth. The Jews are in their eternal homeland, in Israel, amen? But I want you to imagine that for a moment. The Jews were being occupied by the Romans, yet through it all, the Hebrew identity was maintained. And it was maintained as it is with most oppressed peoples through a deep spiritual conviction. A deep spiritual conviction. This conviction was expressed in terms of something called covenant theology. Okay? Covenant theology. The belief that Yahweh, God our Father, had chosen them to play a unique role in world history. The Jewish people had come to expect a Messiah who they believed would enable them to fulfill this divine mission. Now, they had differing opinions on how that would happen. Different, can I see that next graphic of two kingdoms? They had differing, differing opi opinions. They believed, some believed that it would be a Jewish political kingdom, and then some believed that it would be a heavenly kingdom. So from the beginning, there's different sects on how they believe the Messiah is going to come and fulfill that, okay? A, a Jewish political kingdom here on earth, and then others, a heavenly kingdom at the end of the world is when they believed it would be, which many Jewish people considered to be imminent at that time 2,000 years ago. Here they are oppressed. They've been oppressed for 60-odd years already. And they believe that they are chosen, uniquely chosen by God. They believe God has made them promises. They believe that God is true to his word. And one day the Messiah will come and either reign politically in a physical way or in a heavenly way at the end of time. And it goes without saying that religion and politics were deeply entwined and intervened in their culture. Religion and politics deeply intertwined, as religion and politics were deeply intertwined at our founding, the United States of America, yeah. founded by Christian men, largely, not all Christian men, but a strong Christian conviction this uh, nation was founded with, and we've talked about that at different times. But from those two different ideologies, split into four different sects, right, we've got Republicans and Democrats now, right? And independents. They had four different uh, sects. Here they are. They had the zealots. Zealots were revolutionaries. They believed that change would only come by force. Then they had the Sadducees. They believed in power through compromise. The Sanhedrin. The, the same, a lot of the Pharisees sat on the on, on uh, uh, a lot of the Pharisees sat on, on the um, Sanhedrin. But the but the Sadducees, both of them. They believed through compromise with the Romans. Then the Pharisees, they didn't agree. Again, I said Republicans and Democrats, right? The Pharisees didn't agree with compromise or revolution. They were very legalistic. They thought, we've got to do Torah by the book. We've got to do the sacrifices by the book. All of it is going to be an end time. Messiah is going to come at the end of the, end of the world, all of that. And then the fourth group was the Essenes. The Essenes believed that they needed, in order to preserve the Hebrew identity, they needed to withdraw. So they, the, the, the Pharisees are in there, they're arguing, they're saying no revolution, no compromise. The Sadducees are in there saying we need to compromise with the Romans and that's how we can gain power. The Zealots are saying let's pick up the sword. Judas was a Zealot. He would have carried, he would have carried a dagger about that big. Judas was a, was a zealot. Kind of gives you some insight into his thinking when he betrayed Christ, when Christ came and, and he was walking with them and he thought, this is going to be the guy, this is the Messiah. We're going we're to take him by storm, take out our swords and fight. And Jesus is speaking peace and love and he's the suffering Messiah. Ju Judas wasn't happy, obviously. But the Essenes withdrew to the outskirts. Uh, they, they gathered large libraries. They were trying to preserve their culture. They preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls that we enjoy, that we, we, we have them to thank for multiple copies of the Hebrew Bible that were 
remained untouched in the caves of Qumran since as early as 300 BC until their discovery in 1946, two years before the rebirth of the Third Kingdom of Israel. We see in what I'm telling you all of this today, church, because like I said, I'm painting a picture for you. It might be a broad brush, but I'm painting a picture. We see in their culture a number of extremes, don't we? A number of extremes. Revolution by violence, revolution by compromise, revolution by salvation. One thing that they all had in common, though, is that they were waiting for Jesus. They were all waiting for Jesus. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? It certainly does. We can see a lot of similarities between their culture and our culture, can't we? A divided political atmosphere. Some people taking to legalism. Some people compromising in their life. The Essenes, interesting thing about these uh, four different groups is that the Essenes might have been the first to recognize Jesus because of their love of scriptures and preserving the prophecies. They might have been the first ones to recognize him, but they would have been the last to actually physically see them, see him because they had removed themselves from society to such an extent. They wouldn't have even been in Jerusalem when he came riding in. So I paint this picture today because I want to draw the correlation between their world and our world. The climate, their climate, and our climate. This Christmas season, church, I really want you to feel this story. I really want you to feel the depth and the power and the strength in this message that the Lord has given us. They hoped upon hope. Imagine you're occupied by a foreign military force. They hope they're waiting for the Messiah. All in different ways. They're waiting, they're hoping, they're praying, they're waiting for Messiah. They hoped upon hope. They dreamed of the day. I want you to get the magnitude of this fulfillment of prophecy that is the Christ child. This would be the same as if you saw Jesus coming in the cloud while you're driving over to Chili's after work, right? Well, there he is. Right there, right? I think mean, he's prophesied to return, is he not? We will be raptured one day. One day soon, probably. That fulfillment of a, of a of Christ coming back, that fulfillment of prophecy, is no different than the fulfillment of the prophecy the first time. I mean, this is big in church. This is not just a sweet story that we celebrate this time of year. The Christ child is born this day in Bethlehem. He is born. He's here. He's finally here. The problem was, though, for most, and this is the tragedy of the story, if that's possible, is that they dreamed so long. They dreamed so long. They, they prayed expecting the Messiah for so long that they began expecting only what they desire. That can be a problem for us, can it? Until they would only accept what they wanted. And by putting God in that box, church, they missed it. Most of them, most of them missed it. It became about their plan, not God's plan. They missed the fulfillment of over 100 different prophecies because they only would accept what they had trained themselves to expect. A hundred different prophecies. Don't tell me that people don't have a tendency to only see and hear what they want to. Your understanding the plan, get this, this is a good note for you. All right? I should have put it on the screen. Your understanding the plan is not a prerequisite to God. A lot of times we don't understand what he's doing, but he's doing it nonetheless. Am I right? So what did they miss? Let's just give you a few. What did they miss? Luke chapter 24. We're going to cruise through a few scriptures. We may go fast, so you might want to write them down if you can't look them up quick enough. I'll try to give you a second, though. I hear Bible painters. That's always good. Luke 24, verse 44. 
What did they miss? Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So they missed a lot of stuff. Things written about him in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and the Psalms. What was written? Well, for starters, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 reads, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, a virgin birth. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you, Bethlehem, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times, born in Bethlehem. Virgin birth, born in Bethlehem. Notice the scriptures that I'm reading. These are all Old Testament. These are all hundreds of years before the Christ child was actually born. Hundreds of years. What else? Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He would be rejected. They should have known. They should have been looking. They could have known. Let's be careful. It says we're going to reject him. Let's be careful not to. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Wait, am I reading in Matthew right now? Or Mark, or Luke, or John? Are we were reading, because that's what Jesus said on the cross, isn't it? As he, as he, before he gave up the ghost. Right? On the cross he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His very words, there they are, spoken, prophesied hundreds of years before. Isaiah 53. This is a big one. Surely he took up our pain. Verse 4 and 5. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed, pierced for our transgressions. If that isn't powerfully prophetic, even the way he died in church, it was prophesied that he, or the Messiah would come and he would suffer and he would die a humiliating death. Prophecy, church. Psalm 22, verse 16. Here's one more. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Do you think that suggests the manner in which he would die even, church? The Pharisees ordered him crucified. They had access to all of these prophecies. I think that's probably enough for our purposes this morning. I think you get the point. How did they miss it? There's more. There's over a hundred prophecies of the suffering Messiah, Christ child being born, over a hundred that they had. How did they miss it? Probably the same way that we do, would be my guess. Our passion, our desire, our hope, our yearning, all, all things that are good things, emotions that are meant to inspire us, begin to lead us. When the only thing that should lead us is God. Religion based. Religions uh, based on prophecies are a dime a dozen. Did you know that? All kinds of different religions in the world, right? And there's, pro there's lots of prophecies in Islam. Ron talked about them a couple weeks ago. Even. They're a dime a dozen. But church, we hold a faith in a religion that is based and built on the fulfillment of prophecy. And don't let that be lost on you. You believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are believing in the fulfillment of hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands worth of prophecy.
prophecy and prophecy that was fulfilled and prophecy that is still yet on the table that we are witnessing, a prophesied third kingdom of Israel that was we saw fulfilled even in some of your lifetimes. Mm. And I don't want to miss it, do you? There's more to come, and I don't want to miss it because I'm I'm because I have grown to accept only what I expect. I'm telling you, us understanding what God is doing is not a prerequisite to Him fulfilling His plan. Some Christians just shake their heads when they read about the Jews because, oh, they should have known. Can't believe they didn't know, right? How did they miss it? Jeez, they should have known. They, they should have read the Torah. They should have read the prophets. They should have read the Psalms. Even Jesus said they had all those, right? Well, are you reading your scripture? Are you studying prophecy yourself? We are called to. I know nobody likes to hear that. That's like the most le the least, pop least popular thing a pastor can say, right? Are you reading your Bible? Mm -hmm. But are you? Are you a student of your word? We, have, we hold in our possession a book that literally is extraterrestrial in origin. I'm not talking about aliens here, right? Terrestrial just means the earth, right? It comes to us from a dimension where God is, the spiritual realm spoken to his prophets and written down for you and his scribes, right? The word of God put on paper for you to absorb it in a manner that you can. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool thing. Yet a lot of them need to be dusted. But we have an even, even less of an excuse to miss it than the Jewish people did, don't we? They had hundreds of, hundreds of prophecies, and then they miss it. Well, we've got the example of people who had hundreds of prophecies and missed it. So we should learn from the example, shouldn't we? Yet so many are still missing it. And many in the church today are still missing it. And I don't want us to miss it. The power, the depth, the strength, the promise, the hope, all of what we have in this message. Mm. That's pretty good, right? Should we just be done for the day? <laughs> that's probably pretty good. Who didn't miss it? I want to talk about who didn't miss it. And that's where I want to get into part of this story that you may not have heard. Okay? Who didn't miss it? Does anybody know in the Christmas story, when you think about it for a second, who did not miss the prophecy when the Christ child was born? Does anybody know? The Magi. The Magi. Wonderful. The three wise men, right? We three kings of Orientan. <laughs> Right? I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay, so uh, can I, I think I've got a picture of those guys. We have, yeah, there they are. There they are. The three guys, right? They did not miss it. Okay, so I want to stop here long enough to explore this answer of these wise men. And I think you're going to find something pretty powerful in this. Most of what we know about the Magi uh, is from early church traditions. The problem with tradition is that, is that tradition often calcifies over the truth and tombing it. The truth of this message is profound and powerful, and this is just, this is just the first nugget, and we'll, we're going to get to the other piece of this next week. Most people have assumed that there were three wise men um, three of them, since they brought three specific gifts. But the biblical text does not number them. It doesn't say that there were three. Did you know that? They were called magi. From the Latinized form of the Greek word magoi. It's transliterated from Persian, actually, not even from a Hebrew. They were a select group of priests. And our word for magic, actually comes from the same root as Magoi. As the years passed, the traditions became increasingly embellished. By the third century, they were viewed as kings. The Bible never says that they were kings, just that they were magical, right? 
By the 6th century, they gave the three kings names even. We don't have names for them. Ancient Magi were a hereditary priesthood of the Medes, actually. The Medes, known today as the Kurds in Iraq. Interesting, isn't that cool? They're known for, they were known for, for profound and extraordinary religious knowledge. After some Magi being brought to court proved to be experts in the interpretation of dreams, Darius the Great, the king of Persia, Darius the Great established them as overseers for the state religion of Persia because they could so accurate, accurately interpret dreams. Darius is a familiar name, isn't it? Do you remember the story of Daniel? Do you remember that? Darius was the king who elevated Daniel. One of the titles given to, da to Daniel was Rab Mag, Rab Mag, the chief of the Magi. Daniel, pretty cool. Magi is where we get our word today, magistrate. You see how ingrained all of this is with our society? We don't even realize it. Daniel's unusual career, if you remember the story of Daniel, included being a principal administrator in two world empires, the Babylonian Empire and the subsequent Persian Empire. When Darius appointed him a Jew over the previously hereditary Median priesthood, remember those priests didn't take it so well. You remember the story? They didn't take it so well, leading to the plots against Daniel, such as the ordeal where they threw him in all hands dead. Why? Because this Jew was named the head magistrate over, over the, the priesthood. Knowing this about the backstory of the Magi order, is it co any coincidence then? Knowing this Daniel piece of the puzzle, is it any coincidence then that it was the Magoi, the Persian Magoi, that showed up? Remember, Daniel had another prophecy about the Messiah. Do you remember that other prophecy? Uh, and we talk about it every spring when uh, 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 Resurrection Sunday comes around, right? We celebrate the Christ on the cross and risen from the, the, the empty tomb, right? The prophecy of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24 through 26. The prophecy of the uh, uh, Daniel 70 weeks, when God specifically Gives, uh, gives Daniel a prophecy and tells him, here's when the Messiah is going to come. It's going to be in 70 weeks. And he breaks it down into numbers, right? I don't have time to get into that today. But I will share this. We looked at this in this past spring. Can we see it again? Can I see that picture? This is a Cyrus cylinder. In the Persian Empire, they would record history on these Cyrus cylinders. This is on display in uh, the uh, museum in London. Uh, the Government Museum in London. On this Cyrus cylinder is recorded the orders of Artaxerxes to send the Jews back and rebuild the walls. So can I see the next picture real quick? Thank you. Little Cyrus cylinder map, just a, uh, just a uh, we can't jump on this too much, but just to give you a little uh, frame of reference. Remember the prophecy, the fulfillment of prophecy when Jesus came, when he came into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, when he rode in on the donkey, all of that fulfillment of prophecy that we talk about every spring. This, the uh, Daniel chapter 9 prophecy of the, of the 70, 69 and then 70 weeks. The command was whenever the decree is, the angel said, whenever the decree is given, Count this many days, this many weeks, and then the Messiah will come, and then he'll be cut off. And I'm paraphrasing. Well, the decree was given, and the decree is recorded on that Cyrus cylinder I showed you. And the decree was given on March 14, 445 BC. Commandment was issued uh, by Artaxerxes uh, the first, who happened to be Vashti's boy, by the way. 
to rebuild the wall as Daniel chapter 9 said would happen one day. And if you start counting the prophesied number of days, it leads you all the way to April 6, 32 AD, which was also the 10th of Nisan, which was the day that would have been Palm Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, fulfilling the prophecy to the day. If you do a little Cyrus Cylinder math and you mess around with the calendars, it works out for exactly 476 years to the day or 100,070, 173,880 days exactly from the decree to when Jesus rode in on the donkey is the exact number of days that was prophesied in Daniel chapter 9. Pretty incredible, pretty powerful. The decree to, read, to build Jerusalem, I'll just read the bottom. The streets and the walls was given by our Xerxes on March 14th, 445 B.C., 69 weeks or 476 years or exactly 173,880 days later to the day would have been on Sunday, 3280. So that's Daniel. And now Daniel is named the Rabma, the chief magistrate of the Magi. Is it really hard to imagine, and this is conjecture, okay? Is it hard to imagine that Daniel would have inside information as to the, the timing of the Messiah's birth as well? Is it that much of a leap? Or is it coincidence that it was his magi that showed up? You decide, okay? Daniel, Daniel apparently entrusted a messianic vision to be announced in due time, by a star, to a secret sect of the Magi for its eventual fulfillment. The Magi, in the years after Daniel's time, were elevated to the political office of kingmakers in the Parthian Persian Empire. So I want you to think about this for a minute, okay? The same empire that would war one day with the Roman Empire over disputed buffer provinces such as Israel, they're the kingmakers of the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empires would often war back and forth with each other over disputed buffer zones such as Israel. The Romans were defeated on many accounts by the Parthians. On one account in particular, they defeated King Herod's father. You've heard of King Herod in the story? He had a father. His father's name was King Herod. King Herod was defeated by the Parthians over a battle for Israel, for Jerusalem at one point. A retreat that sent the King Herod that we know from our Christmas story, sent him running all the way back, it's recorded, all the way back to Alexandria and then on to Rome. Can I see that map real quick just to show you what I'm talking about in a little bit? Parthian Empire, I should have showed you this a second ago. Roman Empire, buffer zones in the middle, they war back and forth because they both want the land, right? At this time, the Romans have the time of territory. Parthians and Romans go back and forth and back and forth. The Parthians, the Magi, were the kingmakers of that empire. Okay? You're with me so far, right? One of these battles, King Herod goes running back all the way, all the way. Sometime after uh, Herod Jr.'s retreat, though, after he had risen politically in Rome, Herod Jr. was then given a title by this guy. Can I see this next picture? This guy. We all know him, right? Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus gave King Herod of the, of the uh, Christmas story, gave him a title. He said, you will be known as the king of the Jews because I am commissioning you to go and retake Jerusalem from the Parthian Empire. Hmm. And so he accepted the commission and it would take him another three years before he, another three years before uh, he did take Jerusalem and that map behind us would be, ac uh, be accurate. So, Okay, a lot of history today, right? So, 
I want you, with all of this new information you have in hand, when a, think of this, when a troop of Parthian kingmakers showed up, when they showed up in the land of Judah, with, with, what, with what was surely a military uh, uh, caravan, we get this picture in our mind of these three guys on camels going in, right? These were political leaders, the kingmakers of the nation, of Parthian and Roman empires fighting back and forth all the time. The kingmakers are going to speak to Herod. They're not going alone. They would have had a military escort. So much for the three camels, right? Well, when they showed up with what was probably a force that the entire city would have seen from town, asking, where can we find the king of the Jews? It was no doubt an insult to Herod. I'm the king of the Jews. This was my title given me from Caesar Augustus to retake Jerusalem, and I did it. I'm the king of the Jews. And the Parthians, their enemies, show up. Where's the real king? Hmm. It was no doubt a little unsettling. He, of course, played it cool, telling the magic, hey, good luck, you know, tell me when you find them, okay? Yet as soon as they left, he began making plans to execute every Hebrew male child under the age of two. Hmm. They did bring gifts. <clears throat> the gifts they brought. The magi preserved Daniel's prophecy so well. I want you to understand this. They preserved Daniel's prophecy so well, holding it as sacred that even that they even knew what gifts to bring the prophesied king. These are Persians. These are not Jews. They were not raised in Judaism, celebrating the feasts of the Lord and expecting all of these prophecies. Right? No, they didn't. they had what Daniel gave them, and they showed up with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts that were also prophetic as well. Speaking of our Lord's offices as king, as priest, and savior. Mm. Church, church, church. Gold speaks of his kingship. Frankincense it was a spice used for priestly duties. So by giving him, by giving him that, it's like, he'll be a priest. And myrrh was an embalming ointment. So there it is, Jesus. There is Jesus, and they come to worship him. They come because they saw the star, they knew the prophecy, and they bring him an embalming ointment, anticipating his death, even as he was a child. A church. Can I see that, that statement we started with today? Do you believe that when God has a plan, nothing is going to stop it? There was a lot more pieces to this story that were moving all behind the scenes. Nations, the history of nations were at play. Daniel, the favor Daniel received from Darius, even that had everything to do with the baby being born in Bethlehem Church. The reality of what has happened is so powerful and so profound. It stretches through the entire word of God. From the beginning, the end is revealed. From the beginning, the end is revealed. And I don't want us to miss it, church. The significance of what we are celebrating this Christmas season, I don't want us to miss how profound it is. Yet we do, many of us, We're still trying to put God into whatever box suits our tradition or our emotional needs, whatever it is. We put requirements on ourselves. We put requirements on God. Our dreams are now his responsibility or his fault, right? And we devalue the free gift of the manger church. We devalue the gift of grace when we do that. The truth is that there are a million ways this holiday season that we can miss we can miss it. Whether it's because we're being ruled by our emotions, if we're, 
because we're worried about our budget for Christmas presents and stress, or whether we're getting lost in the hustle and bustle of the holiday, or simply because we're not grasping the magnitude of what we're really celebrating. All of the trouble God has really gone through throughout time to bring us to this day, today. Whatever the reason, if we miss the profound nature of what we're really celebrating, we're really missing him. We're really missing him. The Jews were waiting for Jesus. We are also waiting for Jesus. However, we are waiting for him to return because the Messiah has come. Amen? Amen. Amen. Mm, there is a nuanced and intricate story within the Christmas story. Church, it spans the full length of the Old Testament all the way through the end of the New Testament from Genesis to Revelation, from Daniel to Matthew. It's a story that has spanned all of human history. It's a story that has been guided by the hand of God himself. Yet it is a story that has required human participation. And even still now requires your participation. Pretty cool, huh? One thing that we have learned, if nothing else, is let's see that one more time, is this. When God has a plan, nothing is going to stop it. Am I right? He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for your life too. And you are a part of this story. Your faith in the Christ child. Your faith in the gospel of grace, your faith, you are a participant in this Christmas epic. And it is epic. Amen? Amen. Pretty cool, huh? All right. We, I want to show you one more thing, guys. Uh, so every once in a while, something will happen in the news where we believe it's incredibly re relevant to uh, where we are on this timeline of history that we may be witnessing Elements of prophecy being fulfilled in front of us. And when that happens, we want to share them with you. So, because uh, it gets, I mean, it gets hard to watch the news these days, doesn't it? So, I'm going to help you out. If I see something that I think might be relevant prophetically, I'm going to share it with you. Can I see that first one? This is interesting. This is from an Israeli website. Descendants of Gog and Magog joined Russia and Iran in a joint military drill beginning on December 22nd, which also happens to be Hanukkah, the Jewish holiday. Interesting. We actually taught on this prophecy of Gog, Magog, uh, I think it was a couple months ago. Uh, so for those of you who, who were here, you might find this even more relevant. But I believe that this simply points to where we are in history and we really need to be uh, taking up the charge of being watchmen on the wall for Christ's return, as, as Peter tells us to, right? As we're instructed to. So this is incredibly relevant, the time and the date. But as, as we talked about a couple months ago, we see the Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophecy of these nations aligned for the first time in history. Are these nations aligned militarily? And they, have all one, they all have one thing in common, is their hatred for Israel. So, relevant to this point, I've got one more for you as well. Report President Trump and Netanyahu finalized pact to be military allies in Gog and Magog. It's just like, what? We see all of those, the, the one side of, of this battle lining up. On the other side, we have the largest Christian nation, the largest Christian, uh, the, no country has ex- Exported more Christianity in the history of the world than the United States of America. Interestingly enough, though, if you know the prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39, you know that America is not mentioned in that battle. So I find this particularly interesting. Uh, perhaps we have good intentions to help them out, but perhaps we won't be here to help them out. I don't know. There's many different ways that that could come about. But uh, I'm looking up. Are you looking up? Yes. Amen. All right, with every eye closed and every head bowed, we'll close there today. Uh, I hope you found today insightful. Maybe you've learned something you didn't know. But the, the, I hope that the, the depth of this story is encouraging to you. I hope you feel, you feel God's love for you in this message. He's been working on this a long time for you guys. 
He sure has. I encourage you to be here next week too. Because we're going to take this another step further into the Christmas story. Now, if you're here this morning, I talked this morning about the brokenness that we all have, the broken pieces that we all have. And Christmas can be uh, one of the most hurtful times of the year for some people. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're watching online or maybe you're in here right now. But I want you to be encouraged. I want you to feel the Lord's arms wrap around your head. I want you to feel him take those broken pieces and put them back together. This time of year, more than any other, as we focus on this story, the profound, epic nature of this story, if you're here this morning and the Lord's moving on your heart, or maybe you're, maybe you're one of those that doesn't enjoy Christmas so much because the hustle and the bustle and the everything else and you just find yourself irritated more than anything else. Maybe you're missing it that way. I don't know how you're missing it. But if, you are, if you're here today and you've been missing it and you just want to put everything else on pause and put your eyes on him, if that's you here today, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A bunch of you guys. Thank you. And we always do this. If you're here this morning and you've never given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never put your faith in the finished work of the cross, and something today about how deep this story goes and, and how you're a part of this story, you know, when you put your faith and your trust in him that he paid it all, you become a part of this story. If you haven't done that, or maybe it's been a long time since he did, you've not been living that way. If that's you here today and you want to re say prayer of recommittal or for the first time put your faith in him, just raise your hand and put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. You can put it right back down. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the depths that you will go to pick up our broken pieces. Oh, Lord, we thank you. You're the redeemer of our soul. You're the redeemer of our souls. What you've done for us, Lord, we say thank you. And we thank you, God, that you didn't just do it for us and then leave us and say good luck. No, you made us a part of it. You made us a part of us. We thank you for who you are. We ask that you give us clarity of your mind, Father, that we wouldn't miss it this time of year. Whether it's an anxiety, anger and frustration or family trouble, whatever. Lord, we just don't want to miss it. We don't want to miss the profoundness of what you've done for us this year. So focus our minds and draw us to yourself with your kindness with your spirit. Draw us to you, God. Show us, show us the depth of your love this Christmas season. If you're here this morning and you want to say a prayer of recommittal, for the first time, we're going to pray out loud. Let's all say this together. Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you're God. I believe that you love me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead on the third day. Or come into my heart and make me whole. Make me a part of your story. Walk with me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Now, if you haven't gotten a picture with your bad